Hi, it's Dr. Gold again. Uh, here we are up to um, chapter 12 of the textbook. Uh, there's a couple of things in here uh, not covered uh, as well as I would have liked in the textbook, so I'm just going to kind of go over a couple of aspects of chapter 12 that I think are important to reinforce. Uh, first of all, it's important to just take note that uh, the capital markets are marketplaces where uh, individuals meet up with corporations. Uh, individuals come to the table with money and corporations come to the table with a need for money uh, and they kind of negotiate virtually uh, some sort of arrangement or deal and then a transaction takes place. Now, capital markets were formed uh, as a way for companies to gain access to money to expand their businesses and expand their operations. And there are two broad categories of capital markets uh, shown here on the screen. Uh, the first one is called the stock market or equity market, and the other is called the bond or debt market. Uh, there are many, many different stock markets uh, all over the world. Uh, the New York Stock Exchange, for example, is one uh, stock exchange. There are stock exchanges in almost every country around the world, from Israel uh, to Brazil to China and so forth. Um, so there are stock markets all over the world, uh, the most famous of which is probably the New York Stock Exchange down on Wall Street in uh, lower Manhattan. And then there are, of course, bond markets all over the world. There are corporate bond markets, which is a place where corporations go to borrow money from investors. And then there's the U.S. government bond market, where the United States government goes to borrow money from individuals and other entities. On the graph here, you can see a couple of attributes of investing in the stock market and bond market from the perspective of the investor. Okay, it's the person that has the money, it's not the company. So in the eyes of the investor, when they invest in a company uh, to purchase shares of stock, the shares of stock represent a certain amount of ownership in that company. So a person who buys a share of stock in, let's say, Facebook, is a partial owner of Facebook Corporation. Uh, the reason you would buy stock is uh, for really a combination of factors. Number one, you would buy it because you believe the company is going to do well in the future and as a result of it doing well its profits are going to increase and as a result of its profits increasing the value of the stock price will rise in value above that which you paid for it. A second reason why people purchase shares of stock in companies is to get a partial uh, share of the profits that the company is generating. Uh, these are known as dividend payments, and dividends are essentially a share of the profits that are distributed to the, co the common stock uh, shareholders. So uh, when a shareholder uh, buys a, a share of stock, and is expecting to get paid a dividend, the first thing you have to do is to make sure that the company pays a dividend because not all companies pay dividends. Typically speaking and generally uh, you know, speaking, uh, companies that pay dividends tend to be more mature companies like Coca-Cola and Procter and & Gamble and IBM and Microsoft and companies that have been around for a while that are not growing that fast or as fast as they used to grow. So in order to entice people to purchase shares of stock in the company, they um, pay a dividend and say, well, look, buy our stock uh, because not only will it go up in value a little bit over time, but we'll also give you a share of the profits through a dividend payment. Other companies don't pay dividends, and those companies, typically speaking, are faster-growing, newer, younger companies. Like, for example, Twitter does not pay a dividend. Facebook does not pay a dividend. And the enticement for someone to invest in that kind of a company is that it's growing quickly, and eventually the share price will kind of shoot up in value far beyond any amount of money you would have made from getting paid dividends and that's where you would make your money over the long run in that type of an investment. On the bond side, this is typically more of a conservative investment. 
uh, where you lend a company money. So you're not getting ownership in the company, you're lending the company money, and they're agreeing to pay you back uh, the amount of money you lent to them, typically $1,000, uh, over a certain period of time, and they agree to pay you a certain fixed payment uh, every single uh, period. Sometimes it's once a year, sometimes it's twice a year. Uh, those payments are referred to as coupon payments, and it's almost like an interest rate. So, for example, you might lend a company $1,000, and they agree to pay you $100 per year for the next 10 years. So at the beginning of when you first purchase that bond, it's essentially paying you a 10% rate of return because the $100 is 10% of 1,000. And then at the end of 10 years, they give you back the $1,000 that you lent to them uh, and the transaction ends at that point. You don't have to hold the bond for the entire 10 years. You could hold it for a second. You could hold it for a day. You could hold it for five months. Uh, you could hold it for four years. Or you could hold it for the entire period of 10 years. If you choose not to hold it for the entire period of 10 years, well, then you have to sell your bond to somebody else through the bond market. Just like with the stock market, when you purchase a share of stock in Twitter, and it goes up and you want to sell that share of stock because let's say you've made money in it, um, you then sell that share of stock to another person, not to Twitter Corporation, but to another person that wants to buy a share of Twitter. And that's kind of what makes markets, right? You, in that particular example, think Twitter's going down because you want to sell your share of stock. And the person on the other side of the transaction thinks it's going to go up in value, hence they're willing to purchase that share of stock from you. So that's kind of a general overview of the capital markets. There are specific breakdowns within those markets which we'll get to in a second. But you should know based upon what we just talked about that the cost of capital which is now looking at things from the perspective of the company. You know, on this slide, we're looking at things kind of from the perspective of the investor, the person with the money. Well, what do I get? I get ownership in the company. I benefit if the company grows. And I get paid a share of the profits, potentially, from dividend payments. Uh, if I'm an investor and I lend a company uh, money, well, it's in the form of a loan. I benefit from interest amounts paid from uh, for the loan, and those interest payments come to me on a regular basis. Those are kind of the perspectives from the investor side. But from the corporation side, they have to look at it this way. They have to say, well, what are we giving up to the person that wants to purchase shares of stock in our company? Well, we're giving up ownership. And depending upon how much ownership the investors are demanding, will determine whether or not the company wants to sell its stock to that uh, to the public. Uh, in terms of uh, borrowing money from the public, uh, interest rates are the cost of capital to the company. So the company might say, yes, we want to borrow $1,000 from you, and we can pay you 10% interest on that money. And you say to the company, well, I don't want to lend you money for $1,000 for 10% because you're a risky company and I'm not sure I'm going to get my money back. I want to get paid 40% interest on the $1,000 that I lend to you. Well, then the company has to decide, you know, depending upon what they're using your $1,000 for, can they make more than 40%? Probably not. Um, and in which case they would say, I'm sorry, then we can't borrow the money from you. And they'll try to find someone else who's willing to lend the money to them at a lower rate of interest. So that's kind of what the cost of capital is. It's a very, very important consideration if you ever study finance in terms of why and how companies um, gain access to capital. Uh, within the stock market, there's something called the primary market. And this is when a companies first sell shares of their stock directly to investors. Um, this is what's known as an initial public offering, and it's considered a primary market transaction. Uh, and it's like the first time that these new securities are being traded. So a company like Facebook sells its shares directly to the public like two years ago when it first went public and that's called an initial public offering and that transaction takes place on the primary market. 
the secondary market is where most transactions take place in both the stock and bond market and these are markets in which previously issued shares uh, of securities are traded uh, among individuals and or companies um, or pension funds or mutual funds so now the company itself is, so is sort of removed from the transaction here and it's individuals and other entities transacting with one another. That's where most transactions take place on the capital markets each and every day. The capital markets are also uh, sort of um, uh, regulated by the Securities and Exchange Commission, which is a federal agency. Uh, they're tasked with making sure that companies and individuals aren't engaging in what's known as insider trading, where you uh, find out some information about a company that the general public doesn't know about because you, let's say, work at that company and then you rush out and you buy shares of stock in that company or you tell your friends and family to buy shares of stock in the company because some good news is about to come out. Well, that's against the law and you'll go to jail for that, so don't ever do that. Um, so the SEC is sort of in charge of monitoring for that type of uh, regulatory infraction. Uh, the cost of trading to you as an individual typically involves um, commissions that you have to pay when you buy and sell stock. Um, you know, if you're inactive with your trading, there's certain fees that your account could incur. And sometimes with certain entities, there's minimum uh, balances that you have to maintain uh, in order to uh, have the investment account or trading account. These are a couple of good resources. Uh, we've already covered uh, Yahoo Finance a little bit, um, CNN Money, uh, The Motley Fool or Fool.com is a good one. Uh, there at the bottom is the uh, SEC's site. Uh, Edgar is a, a site that provides a lot of free uh, information to financial reports for companies and so on and so forth. So that's a general overview of this chapter. Um, there's a lot more to the chapter that you should read um, in the textbook, but I just wanted to kind of touch on some things that I didn't think the textbook went into as much detail about that I thought was important.